Well, hi, I'm Dr. Michael McDonald, and um, in this video, I would like to explain Plato's allegory of the cave uh, in terms of Plato's own philosophy. And uh, this video is part of a series of videos that are all devoted to Plato's allegory of the cave. And I'll be able to show you several different uh, interpretations of um, this, uh, this great allegory. But I think it's important to begin with Plato himself. Now, for Plato, the allegory of the cave, in a way, summarizes his entire philosophy. Um, and he always meant for the allegory of the cave to be uh, presented uh, in terms of what he called the divided line. And uh, I have presented the divided line in the, um, in the drawing that you see here. And as you can see, we have four parts. And uh, each of these different sections uh, corresponds to a situation within the allegory. Okay, now the, the big dividing line between the two is right at the cave entrance, right? So we have a four-part divided line, and then two parts uh, have to do with the situation inside the cave. And uh, two of the parts have to do with the situation outside the cave. As you may recall, the um, allegory of the cave concerns the situation of a group of prisoners who are trapped in a cave. And they are forced to watch, uh, really, the shadows that are being projected on the wall from a fire. And the fire is represented right here. And then the, the fire brings up a big contrast with the sun, which is what you see, of course, when you go through the cave entrance and you get outside uh, into the light of day. So it's very important to bear in mind that we have uh, two sources of light, um, the fire and the sun. And uh, the fire represents sort of the only light that's available inside the cave. And the sun represents the light that you can only see if you are outside the cave. And another one of the big contrasts that has to do with inside and outside for Plato, on his metaphysical view, uh, for Plato there was a great contrast between what we would call the mutable world or the world of change. That's the three-dimensional world in which you and I live and walk around every day. And um, as you may realize, the main rule with, the, um, with that world is that everything changes. Okay, and for Plato, that was not a good thing. He actually was always seeking knowledge. And for him, knowledge had to be of something that would be unchanging. Knowledge had to be true today, tomorrow, in all times and in all places. So he posited a world of being um, in which um, all things were constant and unchanging and in which knowledge was possible. So that's one of the big divisions that you see when you're just talking about the cave entrance and what lies inside and what lies outside, is that inside the cave represents a three-dimensional reality in which things are always changing and therefore knowledge is not possible. And the two Greek words that we have to describe that situation are eikosia, which means imagination, and uh, doxa, which means opinion. Now, what that means is that uh, inside the cave you are forming beliefs, yes, but the beliefs are without any warrant. They have no logos attached to them. They are beliefs about things that change, and uh, therefore, there can't be any truth inside the, the world of becoming, all right? To get outside the cave and to be seeing in the light of the sun opens the possibility of knowledge. And so the two higher faculties of mind that we have outside the cave are dianoia. And uh, I have translated uh, that as a penetrating understanding the dia, uh, noia means mind, and the dia means going straight to something. And so this is the part of your mind that's able to um, penetrate beneath appearances and find the regularities or patterns that might lie beneath appearances. 
And a good example of that would be, you know, the discovery of natural law. You know, you, you can watch the moon for a long, long time. And over here in the subjective world, uh, where you are just dealing with your imagination and your belief, you can have uh, any number of opinions about the moon, what it's composed of, and so forth. And so beliefs in the world of becoming um, come in two styles. They're either right belief or wrong belief. Uh, for example, on the Earth itself, you can have the right belief that the Earth is round uh, or the wrong belief that the Earth is flat. But if all you're going by is the opinion of your neighbors and the popular ideas that are fomenting in society around you, and you haven't done any real research into it, uh, then you're then all you have is belief and that means that you can't really explain why you believe as you believe to others Once you get outside the cave or using the higher faculty of mind that he refers to as dianoia and This would be the way in which we discover underlying patterns in other words the laws of physics the study of astronomy the um, rule of orbits and you know sending rockets to the moon and and uh, taking photographs. These would all be examples of the kind of knowledge that could be obtained if you were to bring your mind to bear on the subject of the moon. And here again, your belief would be the same. You would still believe that the moon is round or that the earth is round. But in this case, you would have something to back up. You would have a logos. And uh, the knowledge that you have obtained on stage three here with Dianoia does have this quality that Plato wanted of being timeless. Um, why? Because um, the, it's really the laws of mathematics, and they don't depend on time and space. And then for Plato, there was also a mysterious uh, fourth stage of knowledge called Noesis, which is the final stage four. And all throughout our presentation here, we will be doing all of the presentations always with an image of the cave and then using, making use of these four divisions. Now, the next point I wanted to make is that within uh, Plato's uh, own philosophy, it's a sophisticated philosophy. And that means it has uh, a theory of being, in other words, how existence is, uh, which is called ontology is the technical word for that in philosophy. And so the journey from the uh, inside the cave at stage one uh, out to the open light of day and all the way over to true knowing, um, that corresponds with what's called epistemology. And in, in terms of epistemology, the journey of the cave is the journey from uh, being lost in empty imagination and mere opinion that could be right and could be wrong uh, over to where you actually know what you're talking about uh, and maybe have even obtained higher knowledge. So we're going from delusion inside the cave uh, to true knowledge uh, which is only available outside the cave. The movement in ontology which is the theory of being follows the same four stages and the four stages that he identifies in terms of existence itself uh, moves from the least real uh, to the most real. Remember that we must form beliefs about everything. A belief is simply a fixed uh, attitude. And uh, a lot of us inherit our beliefs more or less automatically from the authority figures that are around us and from our parents and from society. And these beliefs may or may not contain uh, deeper truth. So as long as we're floundering in the world of uh, belief, uh, we can have opinion. But Plato did not have uh, a lot of respect for mere opinion. Uh, he said, everybody's got opinions. What I'm after is knowledge. So the journey from uh, an epistemological standpoint goes from the delusion or illusion uh, where beliefs are ungrounded uh, over to true knowledge where beliefs do reflect the reality of what it is you're looking at. Now, this will be easier to explain, I think, as we move forward uh, to, the, uh, to the next slide. Here I've identified 
the two sources of light that we've been talking about. Here's the sun up here and the fire down here. And this is supposed to be a cave, see? And here's the cave entrance. The cave entrance is going to be right at the middle of the dividing line, isn't it? Okay. And so um, you can see that seeing in the light of the sun is a lot different than seeing in the light of the fire. And so again, our great big division into two um, represents symbolically with the fire being inside the cave. That represents our individual consciousness. Okay, the awareness that we use when we are thinking with our own mind and drawing conclusions. The seeing in the light of the sun represents something that's a lot more objective because uh, the sun shines on the good and the bad alike. And uh, in that sense, uh, birth and death, whatever's happening, uh, everybody on earth enjoys the sunlight. So the sunlight is what, in, in the light of the sun, you can see what is. The illustration that I've used here is rabbits, okay? And when you get out of the cave, you're actually able to um, escape a 3D, uh, three-dimensional situation of confinement, which is what's going on in the cave. Okay, you notice that when you're in the cave, you're all closed in, you have a wall above you. You have a wall to your left, a wall to your right, a wall in front of you, and a wall behind you. And of course, your feet are on the ground. Well, that's a very confined situation. And remember that these prisoners are also bound, and they're also under the control of someone else. So inside the cave, and being inside a cave represents uh, subjectivity, or even being lost in subjectivity. And uh, the way I've followed through with this idea of the rabbits is that uh, when you're outside the cave, you can see real rabbits. But when you're inside the cave, the guard has made a paper cutout of the rabbit, of one rabbit. Okay, that's his interpretation of one rabbit. And you can see this is a lot like a TV show in a way because the fire is giving off light and the light is making a shadow. And these prisoners, the only uh, reality they've ever known is this play of shadows inside the cave. And I've used Bugs Bunny as an example here. What if the guards were holding up an image of a rabbit, you know? And then that wouldn't be... Bugs is not a very real rabbit compared with the way rabbits really look and rabbits really behave. And there's a lot of rabbits and there's only one Bugs Bunny. So this is like an artificial uh, image that has been held up. Uh, it, what is so remarkable about Plato's allegory of the cave and will open up so much for us in terms of moder modern media, modern advertising, and things like that, is that we almost have a, a direct uh, parallel to the way that people are entranced by TV advertising and TV images. And Walt Disney Studios gives you one rabbit, a Bugs Bunny, right? So here we've got the guards holding up images, and then they have attached stories to the images. So it is, you're not even seeing real rabbits, you're seeing the image of the rabbit, but then you're also being given a story that explains to you, fully to your satisfaction, what rabbits are and how they behave and how they interact. Okay, so that's why I've got Bugs Bunny show over here on the wall of the cave, and then the prisoners, we have to remember the dilemma of the prisoners is that this is the only reality uh, that they've ever known. So again, we have our four main stages that I talked about earlier uh, on display here with the cave entrance, and then uh, presumably our um, escape prisoner who has become free uh, over here and is able to see real rabbits in the light of the sun. Uh, he wants to share that knowledge. He has uh, returned back into the cave. He uh, speaks to one of the other prisoners and says, Hey, there's a whole world out there, and if you will follow me, I can show it to you. It's, it's much more real than what you're experiencing in here. Don't let these guards manipulate you and tell you what's real. You know, follow me and we'll escape from the cave. Now, you notice uh, the final point I think I want to make here is that when you're outside the cave, 
Um, what happened to all of those walls? Remember, we were in an enclosed 3D atmosphere down under the ground. Now we are up and above the ground. And uh, you notice that the cave has a roof over the top. And when you're outside, there's no roof like that, is there? Uh, you can look up and see the stars. And so you become aware of your universal context. Okay, that's why we have a kind of mystical um, feeling with stage four because you're actually able to see where you are in the universe as a whole. Uh, the sun actually is a star and there's a lot of other stars in the cosmos as well. So, um, and then it's also interesting when you look at your four directions because remember inside the cave we had a wall and uh, we, the prisoner was bound and so there's no exploration going and there's actually a limit to what can be known on every side. You, what is in front of you, what's behind you, what's to the side, um, what's to your right or left. Um, all of that is uh, circumscribed for you. But when you get outside, hey, if you want to walk forward, you can walk forward uh, as far as you want to. That will be part of your explanation uh, of your exploration. And that's part of your freedom as well, is that those walls are not there. If you want to walk to the left, you can walk to the left. If you want to see what's behind you, you can uh, turn your head or turn around and explore in that direction as well. So there's a great deal more freedom once, I, once you are out of the cave, and that's part of the symbolism as well. All right, well, I think that we have uh, gone through the basics at this point. Uh, as long as you've seen that there's uh, two main divisions being inside the cave and outside the cave and that Plato goes further to break down uh, being either inside or outside into two further subdivisions. And I think you can see how well this all hangs together with uh, Plato. Every stage of existence corresponds to a certain faculty of mind and a certain faculty of knowledge uh, which is possible at that level of being. And uh, that's what you get when you have a sophisticated philosophy in which the philosopher has managed to uh, take the time to make the, his different views of things hang together. And Plato is a very great philosopher. I have a separate video, uh, by the way, if you were wondering, you know, who Plato is and how he relates to um, Aristotle or to Socrates, um, and look in our video of uh, Plato, His Life and Times. And I also invite you to uh, check in our other videos uh, in which um, we'll be able to take this uh, basic setup here that we just introduced and apply it to today's world and do so in a number of different ways. The last thing I'd like to say is that that's what an allegory is. Okay, an allegory is a sophisticated, consciously created symbol. And it has all the power and impact of a real symbol. But in this case, it's a symbol that was created by Plato in order to explain his philosophy. And so, actually, in allegory, you have that coming together of the imaginative power of the subconscious mind, which is what lies behind symbolism, and yet it's merged with, with a genuine use of the discursive mind, uh, which means that uh, you get this wonderful richness. And uh, I hope that you will tune in for the uh, other um, interpretations of the allegory of the cave. Again, my name is Dr. Michael McDonald, and uh, I'm so glad that you joined me here. And I hope that you'll tune in again and see the rest of the videos as well. Thank you so much for your time and attention.